Greetings from Stanford University. I'm Bill Barnett, professor at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. And I'm Ingrid Ackerman, a Stanford undergraduate in the School of Engineering. And we're here today with several of our colleagues. We have Rodolfo Durso, a professor at the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. We've got Dr. Sybil Diver. She's the co-chair of Stanford's Environmental Justice Working Group. And we've got Carly Moore, who is a PhD student in the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. Welcome to all three of you. Now, we just had a few days ago a conference here at Stanford on the subject of environmental justice. And uh, we can't wait to hear from all of you about uh, what went on at the conference and, and what we learned. Uh, Ingrid, why don't you kick us off? Sure. So just to kind of give our, our audience some context, would one of you mind explaining environmental justice? Go ahead and I follow you, perhaps. Thank you. Um, environmental justice can mean many things. That was one of the beautiful aspects of this conference of inviting different aspects into the room. Um, I often define environmental justice as a response to systems of environmental racism. Um, it's also an idea that's built into our legal system in the United States um, where we define environmental justice as the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, uh, enforcement of environmental laws. That, you know, uh, and that was Sybil here with that response. Thank you, thank you, Sybil. Uh, is there a debate out there? Are there people who might disagree with that definition? I would say that if we go back to the history of environmental justice, which was a wonderful theme of the conference that Dr. Emily Polk brought to us, um, bringing us to some of the early uh, early moments in the movement with Warren County protests um, that, that resisted the placement of a toxic dump of uh, PCBs in a predominantly low-income um, black community. And that if we look at the history of environmental justice, it's rooted in social justice movements such as the civil rights movement where we start with looking at the issues of um, racial discrimination and the fight to address that uh, in our country and moving from there into environmental problems that are really intimately connected with problems of environmental degradation and sustainability and where we look to um, social movements and the ability to connect research and social movements together as occurred in the early days of the environmental justice movement with Robert Bullard's work really mapping out how this isolated incident seemingly in Warren County actually spoke to a broader pattern of uh, which we established through data looking at how sightings of toxic waste um, are predominantly determined not by housing, um, home ownership, not by income, but uh, definitively by race. That's incredible. That's really in incredible. Uh, uh, let's see, uh, Carly, you um, uh, were at the conference. As a, a, a student, uh, your view on this is important, not only because you're the uh, representative in many ways of the bright young minds coming up, but also you're in this next generation uh, for whom sustainability and environmental justice is so important. What's your reaction to what went on at the conference? Well, it was a fantastic opportunity to gather with intergenerational researchers and community-based organizers around the movements that are happening, the movements that need to happen, and how we can facilitate that, both within the university from an academic research perspective, but also in capacity building and raising awareness about the issues that are important to all of us. I think Sybil gave a great definition of environmental justice. And one thing that draws me in is it's not only about stopping the injustices, but also thinking about how we can restore and repair and bring about reconciliation by thinking about how we fairly distribute environmental goods, things like parks or increased ownership of and control of land are really important in the movement. 
So on that note, one thing that really struck me was the broad variety of things tangentially related or honestly very integral to environmental justice. Um, we covered a lot of topics in the conference and Rodolfo, would you mind highlighting a few things that surprised you or intrigued you at the conference? I'd love to do that, but uh, if I may, I can, uh, uh, I'd, like, I'd love to quickly complement what uh, Kylie and Sebel have said, uh, because I think the definition of environmental justice is, is can be a little bit tricky for some people. Uh, um, I would like to say that environmental justice is all about inequality, inequity, and everything that has to do with equity, but with an emphasis on the environment, falls uh, in the realm of environmental justice or injustice. And um, to me, I think there are two critical elements to it. One is that we have a wonderful planet today in geological times, a planet that never had had the same level of biological richness as we have today. But the benefits of that beautiful mega ecosystem, our planet Earth as a functioning ecosystem, is not distributed equally across multiple sectors of society, different sectors of society. On the other hand, we're doing very complicated critical things to the environment today and the consequences of that are not distributed, are not being suffered equally by the dif by different sectors of society. That inequality of those two components to me is at the heart of environmental injustice and we want to address that by doing environmental justice. Um, some of the highlights to me uh, were the fact that uh, the multifaceted uh, nature of environmental justice was pretty evident in, in this event. We started with an indigenous person that talked about how um, land use change, how um, interventions uh, have impacted the traditions, the knowledge, and the way of people knowing and interacting with the environment. The message that that person provided was absolutely powerful, and I think that set the tone for us to be in a mindset that created a very nice, engaging, wonderful atmosphere in, in the program. All the highlights were that um, the variety of topics included things that had to do with ecology, with geography, and with art, for example. One of the speakers presented uh, a, a play that he's developing to bring to uh, people who are usually very much neglected. People going from, for example, firefighters that have to do critically with environment, many of whom are incarcerated people, right? How can they appreciate the beauty of the environment, the protection of the environment, and at the same time suffering these consequences of environmental justice. So a plethora of wonderful vignettes addressing multiple facets of what is this fantastic interdisciplinary topic of environmental justice. Thank you. Uh, one of the topics that stuck out to me was how agriculture um, relates to environmental justice. And Carly, I was wondering if you want to speak on this topic. Of course. So I primarily study agriculture for tribal nations in the U.S. and think about ways that we can um, understand the processes of climate change, what that means in terms of adaptation, mitigation, and preparing for a different climate than that we've experienced before. I also think about policies, those that have been long-lasting and new ones that are coming into effect and how they particularly interact with federal Indian law and tribal law to either make uh, more accessible opportunities for tribes or in a lot of cases add additional barriers. Uh, in particular, I'm thinking about uh, the, the clean energy transition and how uh, a lot of times renewable energy is very land intensive, solar and wind among others, and how uh, tribal nations um, have uh, management of vast lands in the U.S. that would be um, uh, highly desired to be in renewable energy production, but also there's other values on those lands, uh, including spiritual and cultural and agriculture and feeding our people. And so in particular, I'm thinking about the land requirements for solar, how solar siting is usually on uh, agricultural land, and are there ways to think about a win-win solution in combining these two as opposed to displacing? So there's a topic that's becoming increasingly more popular called agrivoltaics, where you have solar energy production panels, but you also have agricultural production through crops or greenhouses or grazing animals. And so uh, something like that, where tribes are able to look at all their options and exercise uh, decision making that's under their authority to figure out we don't have to choose between energy and food, maybe we can have both on the same land. That's just incredibly inspiring uh, to hear, Carly. And 
uh, I wanted to turn to you, uh, uh, Sybil, uh, coming away from the conference, of all the various uh, ideas you heard being talked about, you know, you, you know, in the environmental justice working group, there you're always every day part of a an ongoing creative uh, discussion. What what surprised you and impressed you coming out of this conference? Oh, thank you for that question. Um, I think that we're working with a very challenging issue, one of the defining challenges of our time in sustainability. And what in impressed me at the conference is what continues to impress me actually also in the movements, which is the perseverance um, of people in the face of inequity and harm to find ways and pathways to restore and repair, just as um, my colleagues Rodolfo and Carly were mentioning. And I think some of the ways that people um, discussed strategies that they used for doing that were really exciting to me. And maybe two of the themes that really um, just hit home for me are first, um, the consistent message across so many speakers about the agency and knowledge held in communities, impacted communities themselves, and how um, a, a wide range of how people in academia could work together to amplify and enhance community leadership in a lot of these spaces and complement one another with the contributions that we can make through research, through student engagement, um, but always recognizing and hearing a lot of the leadership coming from frontline communities themselves. And then the second point I think Rodolfo already spoke to was you know, the, the interdisciplinarity and also intergenerational aspect of the work. We had presenters from freshmen to PhD to professors and uh, all bringing amazing expertise. And I felt um, the message around including youth voices and youth knowledge in the work that we do um, to try and engage with these really wicked problems and find hope and creative pathways forward to be very inspiring. Well, that was one of the objectives of the conference, actually, to provide a friendly forum for learning collectively, including researchers, students, practitioners as well. So I think that uh, um, that um, a convergence of people with different expertises uh, in major disciplinary areas actually was a, a highlight of the conference. Another point, Bill, that seems to me very, very uh, relevant uh, that came out of the conference is that, um, of course, you know, we'd, we have been defining what are the problems of environmental justice, um, what are the possible solutions to it, and then how can we prevent further types of uh, environmental injustices that we have been experiencing, or people have been experiencing for centuries now. And so to the attempt to close in the gap between knowledge and action, that was another element that I found to be very, very important in the conference. And many of the conference actually, even from the students, went in that direction, which to me was very inspiring and very attractive and very rewarding to have done that kind of an approach. That, that's inspiring to hear. Can you give an example of where that was the case, Rodolfo? Yeah, for example, in the case of, um, of land use change, um, a critical phenomenon has been that um, the conversion of traditional lands and agricultural lands in the traditional sense and also natural ecosystem landscape that combined nature and agro, agro ecosystems uh, were transformed by monocultural plantations, were transformed by heavy industrialized agriculture. How can they create a mosaic of conditions in which you can have different uses of the land while maintaining, by the way, in some sense, uh, in some areas, the processes that they do in terms of maintaining agrobiodiversity, the diversity that comes from the interaction of humans and, and nature, and how can we define different ways of using the land in a much more um, comprehensive and in a much more diversified way instead of a typical approach, which is dramatic for our society today, which is the massive industrial uh, monocultural agriculture. That yeah. would be, for example, a case that yeah, exemplifies that. That seems incredibly important. Another really striking example of taking the concept of environmental justice and integrating it into action um, that spoke to me was David Gonzalez's work. He is studying oil and gas drilling in the city of LA and in other urban areas mm -hmm. um, in California. And a lot of his research um, has to do with how exposure to um, 
exposure to the chemicals coming out of these drilling sites um, can cause preterm birth and other adverse health effects for both the mothers and children of mothers wow. um, in in these urban areas. And so his the work that he's publishing is having direct Im- impacts on legislation and future drilling, et cetera, in these places. Um, and hearing him speak about both that process and um, reactions to it were, were pretty impactful mm-hmm. and inspiring. That is fantastic, Ingrid, because that, in, in some sense, his, com- his presentation and, and some others actually made it evident that the scientific knowledge, the scholar uh, exercise within EJ, can actually be very relevant to close that gap between knowledge and action. This is, to me, that was a wonderful example of how the engagement in the academic, in the scholar work of um, environmental justice can actually address critical problems. He uh, used examples of his papers being used by, you know, big agencies of the government to address questions of that nature, the impact of pollutants on human health. So now, Carly Moore, we're going to let you have the last word. (laughs) Looking forward, coming out of this conference, what are your hopes for the future? Mm, There's so many. I'm hopeful at different levels. Uh, I'll start here at Stanford. I'm really excited that we have an opportunity to bring more scholars into the Door School of Sustainability through an environmental justice hire that's ongoing. I'm really excited about the numbers of students, both undergrads and graduates, who take an interest in this, uh, shown by the attendance at the conference, but also by enrollees in classes that many of which are taught by Sybil. In terms of my personal life and and the communities that I care about the most. I'm from the Lumbee tribe of North Carolina and I think about my home and all of the environmental challenges that we're facing, uh, biodiversity, water access and water quality, and then the overarching crisis of climate change. And I'm hopeful that as more of the scientific information gets out there, that the organizers and activists in our community who care the most and know the most at the local level will have access to that and will be able to use that to persuade their policymakers to increase protections and provide opportunities to have resilience and recovery. Incredible. Incredible. I I cannot finish this podcast without saying thank you to GSB. Thank you, Bill, for providing the for facilitating this amazing conference. I think that what we gain from bringing this community together was absolutely uh, benef- is going to be absolutely beneficial and and fantastic for for the purposes of bringing environmental justice to the appreciation and engagement of people broadly. So thank you very much for the opportunity to organize it and for providing the all the facilities that we needed to do that. Well, I, I have to say on, on uh, behalf of uh, the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Stanford Door School of Sustainability, thanks to each of you, Rodolfo, uh, Carly, Sybil, uh, and thank you too, Ingrid, for uh, your participation in this. Look, the road ahead, the road ahead is fraught with tremendous challenges, but I come away uh, from hearing from you each of you much more inspired uh, as a result. And we look forward uh, to uh, another conference in environmental justice next year as we continue your good work. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. you. And to the listeners, thanks very much uh, for tuning in. Until next time. The Stanford Initiative on Business and Environmental Sustainability podcast series is sponsored by the Stanford Graduate School of Business, and the Stanford Door School of Sustainability. Music by Charged Particles. That's Caleb Hutzler, Mike Rock, and John Krosnick.